One of the questions I had, because it relates to how interested you are, Jan, when was the first time that you saved seeds in your life? Can you remember what, what it was and, oh. and when it was? Or Let's see. Probably tomato seeds. Um, it's the easiest to save, right, or pretty easy? Well, I had to research how to save them okay. the best way. And um, I've always thought, well, if something grows really good, then I need to, I need to save seeds from it. Or if I see a flower, I'm like, oh, yeah, that's nice. i gotta, I got to save seeds. It kind of becomes an addiction, you know. So, you know, you see stuff that, that you want, you got to have it. My mom and my sister, I mean my sister, my daughter, Rocks, yes, rocks was the very first thing that I saved. So you went from rocks to seeds? Rocks to seeds. Okay. But I've always known there's an importance to saving seeds. Um, even so from she's a time. hoarder. I'm a seed hoarder. A Monsanto hoarder. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> no, no Monsanto anything. No, no, um, that's just a joke, folks. She really doesn't work for Monsanto. No, uh, the, um, but tomatoes, I think, is probably the first thing that I ever worked with that I really liked and found out that they would grow easy when you save them. Do you They're remember how long ago that was? Were you a child or an adult or not sure? Child, yeah. You, it was when you were a child, yeah, okay. young. Very good. Very young. Yep. So. And I think it worked out the same for me too. Uh, probably my grandpa, trailing behind my grandpa in the gardens, you know, and wanting to save a variety of seed for some reason or thinking it was cool to get the seed and replant it. You know, every little kid likes doing that. Uh, how about you, Will? Did you, uh, do you remember when you first became interested in seeds? Was it when you found your grandfather's collection? Oh, no. Um, my grandparents raised me because my parents were working. So I was in the garden with my grandfather as a small boy. Um, there, I have a picture in my previous lecture of me in 1952 in my garden clothes, and I know I was saving seeds then. Oh, wow, that's great. <laughs> um, I recall Dr. Martin's Lima because we had it in the garden, and I think I may have been given the project to take the dry seeds out of the pods and you know, spread them out to dry even more. That may have been the very first... Well, we, and we've got a grower working on bringing that back to us, too, this year. So we lost Dr. Uh, Martin's Lima bean in our catalog for whatever reason. Sometimes it happens because growers have crop losses, and so we lose the inventory. And if it's don't have any inventory, we're not putting in the catalog, right? And uh, it took a number of years for us to, to get back even a small amount of seed. But a grower is working on well, that Well, my, my grandfather knew Dr. Martin. Dr. Mm -hmm. Martin was a dentist who did this seed thing on the side. Um, and Dr. Martin was charging 25 cents per seed. Wow. And what um, year was that? That's back in the 1920s, oh early my 30s. And so that was pricey that stuff. Was a highway robbery. Yeah. So my grandfather was... But it's very, a big white lima, too. A big though, lima. So. I'll tell you what the problem with Dr. Martin's lima is, that its seed viability is at ambient temperature is mm -hmm. about three years. That's the cutoff date. So if your growers aren't storing it right, they're going to lose the seed just like that. So we have to grow it out every two years. That's how we get around it. I have a strain that's directly from Dr. Martin. In the freezing of the seed. The can freezing, you, you can do you that. Can do that's the freezing fine. with the lima sure. bean. That's fine. So uh, growers aren't really expected to store or warehouse seed unless they have a surplus crop. So if I, and, and I'm jumping to information, you need a little bit more information to understand this fully, but. Uh, if you are contracted to grow 16 ounces of a tomato seed at $22 an ounce for us, and you have a great bumper crop and you end up producing 32 ounces, if I don't need more than 16 because the contract was only for 16, I'm not bound to legally buy that from you. I don't have to buy it. You can offer it to us and we might say, yeah, we, uh, we had another crop failure from another grower on the same thing. We'd like to buy your, your, the rest of your surplus. But if we say no, not right now, because the 16 ounces will su suffice our supply and demand for the upcoming three years or so, then you can hold on to that seed. So holding it and uh, offering it to us at a later date might actually be lucrative. Have you ever uh, sold a seed later from a surplus crop? Has that happened to you yet? No. 
It happens to a number of our growers that they'll have a bumper crop, and some of them try to have a bumper crop because they think, hey, Martin's a pushover. He likes to buy seeds, and, and I am, and uh, he likes to buy seeds, and they'll offer me uh, some extra hoping that I'll take it. And sometimes I say no, though. Sometimes, you know, I'm not going to jeopardize the company's finances by uh, over-purchasing seeds that we don't need. And um, they can hold on to it. They're free to take it and sell it to another seed company or feed it to animals or whatever they want to do with it. Or they can hold it and offer it to us a few years later. And if the germination is still good, then I might say, yeah, we need that. I was about to have a grower start working on it again, so it works out there. So let me fill in the gaps now on the seed production. I have an information packet when people call and say, I'd like to know about your seed production program. That information packet tells about the pricing schedule, uh, what we pay per ounce or per unit of uh, weight. And um, it tells some of our other expectations of our growers and some of the stipulations. And it gets it, start, gets it started. There's a questionnaire at the back of that information packet that we ask the grower to fill out to tell us, us a little bit about them, what their experiences are, their interest is, uh, the crop types they like, and the, um, the property that they're growing on, they intend to grow on. So we get that in here. And then um, during the assignment process, I can access all of those uh, answers and those responses in the questionnaire, as well as every year. Uh, was last year the first time I, I think that I did the letter of intent? That's the first mm -hmm. time you got it, yeah. right? I'm now doing also, in addition to the questionnaire, the questionnaire and the uh, information packet covers the first time that uh, you are in contact with our company about growing seeds. And then after that, I will send out a letter of intent, and it's a single page that says, hey, will you grow seeds for us? This next one's going out in October of this year. It, it says, are you interested in growing seeds for us in 2019? And if you answer yes, you send it back to us. Uh, also on that same sheet is uh, a list of crop types that you would be willing to try in 2019. And so you just check off the crop types that you think you'd like to go. And what I like to do is I like to match up with a grower something that they like to grow. I don't want a grower to be growing something they just really aren't interested in or something they're not good at. And so it makes sense to try to put something with them they enjoy and love anyway. And something maybe, maybe somebody is so passionate about zinnias. We've got growers that are passionate about peppers. Noe Hernandez, who spoke yesterday, I don't know if anybody here attended his uh, presentation on seed starting, but he's another one of our growers from the, the deep southeast. And... Um, uh, he is passionate about growing peppers. And so I'm going to load him up with peppers, right? It makes sense to do so. So I get these letters of intents back with all their uh, responses. I enter all that information into a spreadsheet. And then every year, myself and other members of our management team will assess what our company needs to be produced based upon our inventory and based upon our sales. It, uh, an item has to meet a certain sales level before it gets in the catalog because it's expensive to build those catalogs that we put out, folks. It really is. And uh, kudos to Jer and the whole management team that we can get it done. It's a, a work of art. It really is. And I'm so proud of our catalog. But to get it into the catalog, it, it's expensive. So it has to have a reasonable expectation of selling a certain amount before we put it in there. Having said that, if we sell a lot of seed and it depletes our inventory, then I need to rotate it back into the seed production program and get growers going on it again. Jared Gettle has asked me to have a three-year supply on hand at any one time of all of our grower seeds. With 200 growers, they're producing about 700 varieties for us out of the 2,000. The rest come from commercial sources. So that's about 40% or so uh, of our uh, of our. Um, items that we carry in our catalog of our varieties. Uh, so we'll match the growers up with our, our needs based upon our supply and demand. Some growers have the misconception that when they uh, contact us, they, they say, well, send me a list of everything you need and I'll pick what, you, what I want. And it doesn't happen that way, you know. We have to do the matching. There's a lot of thought that goes into it. You know, we know what crops are... Most of the time, we know what crops will grow in what regions, and we also want to match it with skill levels. If I come across that seed that I described earlier that's been in, in the, the, the locked away in a chest for all that time, I'm going to put it into the hands of a skilled grower and not necessarily one of my novice growers. No disrespect intended to anybody that's a novice grower. All of our growers are important to us. We appreciate them all very much, and um, they, they are all treated equally as far as uh, payment goes and, and so forth. So um, I will send out the information packets. I'll send out the letters of intent. And that's how you get 
introduced to us in our seed production program. Um, today, what I'm going to do, and I wasn't sure whether this tent would be packed full. I honestly thought it would be a crowd about this size because it's late in the event. It's late in our whole festival. It's the final event of the uh, speaker event of the festival. So it's okay to have a smaller crowd, but I brought with me some contact information, email addresses, uh, an email address, a phone number, and I'm going to, uh, I, I didn't, I don't have business cards here um, because we spent all our money on our catalogs and we can't have, afford business cards. So what I did is I printed off some of our labels with my contact information. I'm gonna paste it to a, a packet of free seeds uh, various varieties, cucumbers and mustard seed. And if you're interested in our seed production program, you can get that. And then best way to reach me is by email. Okay. Send me an email because I, I also work out in the gardens producing seeds. I do all the processing here for Baker Creek seeds and, uh, and your best to catch me on email. And then I can send the stuff to you digitally, but I'm very happy to send it to you in other, uh, formats. Also, we have a lot of, uh, what we call plain people growers, uh, the Amish, Mennonites, and, and so forth, who some of them don't utilize telephones and won't utilize telephones or computers. And, and the communication with them is a bit more complicated and it's slower, it's by mail. And, but we've got quite a few of them and they're usually good growers. I'm more than happy to do it that way. If that's what it takes, it's okay. Nobody, uh, nobody gets judged for not being part of the digital age. I still don't have a cell phone, and I, I don't want people to judge me. So, um, so anyway, um, that's kind of it in a nutshell. You can learn more about it when you get the information packet. So if you're interested in being a part of the seed production program, I'll, uh, I'll get you this label for you to take home, and you can contact me at a later date.